Hello, today is October 20th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Libraries Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Edward S. Raddock. Welcome, Ed. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thanks. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Clinton, Mass, March 25th, 1924. Did you grow up in Clinton? Yeah, until I went into the Navy. And you graduated from high school there? No, I, I left high school to enlist in the Navy in 1942. How old were you then? 17. What is your current address? Three. Natick, Mass. And your marital status? I was married to Anna Canny, and we were married 53 years before her death. And you have children? Yes, three children. Boys, girls? All girls. And any grandchildren? Yes, five. And two great-grandchildren. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Where and when did you enlist in the military? I enlisted in Boston at the post office building, October 27, 1942, which was Navy Day at that time. Why did you join? Well, all my friends were in the service and I felt lost and I want to contribute something to my country. And what branch did you join? Uh, U.S. Navy. Why? Well, I just thought it would be a place where I would have a better chance for a career. And you made the decision, you said earlier, to do this and to leave school early. Was it because of what was happening in the war? Yes, it is. Talk about how you heard about that and, and maybe what it was like for you as a young 17-year-old. Well, uh, we all had the patriotic feeling to contribute something to our country. And I kind of felt a little lost because all my friends were in the service. And I thought it would be the best for me to do the same thing. Did your parents feel the same way? No, my mother objected to it, but my father being in World War I, did not object to it. Were you sent then to basic training out of Boston? I, we left Boston uh, on November 3rd. Where I attended boot training at Great Lakes, Illinois. Had you ever been outside of New England before that? Just to Connecticut. So was this considered an adventure for you or were you a little Afraid? What was it well, like? Well, I was very uh, on the way to the Great Lakes on board a plane, a uh, train. Uh, I felt a little apprehensive, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. What do you remember liking or disliking about basic training? Well, I didn't mind it because. Uh, my company commander was a movie star, Rod Cameron, and... Did you know that when you saw No, him? I didn't. <laughs> but it was a pleasure being in the service with him because he was very demanding and kept us pretty well regulated. So at the time, did you appreciate that, or looking back, did you realize that what he did was important? Well, I think it made me grow up a lot by obeying rules and regulations. I think it made a better person of me. How long were you in BASIC? Uh, 90 days. And from there, did you receive any advanced or specialized training? Yes, I attended Virginia Beach Radar School. 
And was that because of some testing that you were given and this showed that you might be good yes. at this? So you went from Illinois to Virginia Beach. Yes. What do you remember about that? <laughs> it, it, like it was yesterday. Yeah. And what was your day like? At Virginia Beach? Yes. Well, we were constantly at classes and we learned how to operate surface radar, air radar, gunnery radar. And when you say we, how many were in your class? Oh, I really don't know, quite a few. Mm -hmm. Does that mean 50, 100, or more? I would say m most likely 50. Did you befriend any of them? Not at that time. Mm -hmm. Only the ones that I was assigned to the ship with. And at that point in time, you weren't assigned to any ship yet, were no. you? How long did you say you were in radar school? I think it was like close to 30 days. And at the time, did you have any idea where you would be going next? No. And where did you go after that 30 days? Then I was assigned to the USS Baltimore. And at the time, it was still being compl uh, completed at Four Rivers in Quincy. So it was still and, being built. Yeah, and we were stationed at the Fargo building on Summer Street in Boston. So you were back in Boston. Were you able to get leave at times or go home? Just the evenings or long weekends. And while you were stationed there, what was your daily routine like? Well, we went, we first had roll call and we would have uh, classes of operation of radar and we did basic training and just to keep us active. Mm -hmm. And how long before the Baltimore was ready? On uh, April 15, 1943, we commissioned the USS Baltimore in South Boston. So was it quite a formal affair? Very much so. And you were part of that? Yes. What do I you was. remember about it? Well, I remember the day it was commissioned, everybody was dressed in their best clothing. Including the midshipmen and others on the ship? Uh, officers, mm -hmm. everybody was something special being aboard a ship when it's commissioned and then we became plank owners explain uh, what a plank owner is a plank owner is a sailor that's aboard a ship when it's a commission and he owns one plank of that particular ship and that's considered an honor yes it is and I know we have pictures of you at a reunion with other plank owners, correct? Yes. Yeah. And were the, so these were individuals who were with you at that time? Correct. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who christened the ship? Uh, it was the, I don't remember her name, but it was the mayor's wife from Baltimore, Maryland. Because it was named after Baltimore. Yes. So once it was commissioned, did you know right away where you were going, or was it still kind of kept under wraps? No. Uh, uh, we were told we were going to Trinidad in the West Indies for sh what they call a shakedown cruise. That's to... Uh, learn how to fire guns, how to hit targets, and hit targets with radar ranges. And they'd have a plane with the drone and we'd fire at the drone. So this is where all of you, those who were going to be firing the guns, those who were going to be giving the orders, and you, a radar man, right. were all going to learn 
how to right. survive. It was really. really. It was a great experience. Was the sh seeing the ship for the first time a little overwhelming for you? Very much so. <laughs> because it was a pretty big ship. It is. It was 673 feet long. Sometimes they compare them to football fields. Yes. What would that be compared to a football field? Well, I'd have to divide that by three, right? I have no idea. So it was pretty large. Yes. How many do you think were on the ship? 1,500. And talk about on your way to Trinidad, you're getting used to living on a ship. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. What was that like for you? What were your living conditions like and your time on and your time off? Well, what we did uh, when we were out to sea, we were four hours on and eight hours off. That rotated 24 hours. So while you're on, you're doing radar stuff, so to speak. That's all mm -hmm. I did, yes. Mm -hmm. And where were you doing this? Well, I was, they had us assigned to all the radars at different periods. You weren't assigned permanently to one. And how many radars would there be on a ship like that? Well, we would have uh, quite a few radars. We'd have a surface radar air radar, and then we'd have a gunnery radar that would take measurements, direction, and angles with, uh, from a gunnery uh, turret. So were you all in a room together? No, all separated. Mm -hmm. There is one main room where we took all the information and we plotted it on tables and then we would report it to the gunnery officers. And we also had a computer aboard ship at that time. Back then you had a computer. Yes. And the interesting thing was this particular computer was huge. And what it would do is uh, calculate the temperature of the water, the current of the water, uh, the wind velocity, the temperature, and, it would, and when they fired a gun, the gun would stay straight and the ship would move around the gun. So you were firing like on a regular surface. Interesting. So was that one of the first ships to have computerization on it? Uh, that I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. So when you were on for your four hours, you were busy? Oh, yes. What was it like when you were off for those eight hours? Well, sometimes we were assigned to do certain duties. Other times you'd just relax. Was it difficult to relax in such close quarters? Not really. And when you relaxed, did you have, you didn't have your own room, did you? No, no. So you had bunk types? Bunks, yeah. Was it claustrophobic for you? Not really. And what about hearing from or writing to home? That was very important. Did you do a lot of writing yourself? Always, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got word from home also? Right. Mm -hmm. so I, what st I still have all the letters I wrote to my mother and father. Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> I hope they're in archival quality <laughs> yeah. boxes, are they? Yes, Speaking they are. Speaking from a library point of view here, huh? <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Once you arrived in Trinidad, what do you remember about the place? I, it sounds rather mystical to me. Well, we weren't allowed to go ashore mm -hmm. at that particular period. We were all assigned to the ship, and we were just there to learn about how to affect the enemy. And you were hearing more about any of the confrontations that were happening already? or Yeah, we had a little uh, newspaper every day aboard our ship. And that's how you learned some of the yeah. news? How about radio? 
No, we weren't allowed to have radios. Once in Trinidad, after you did some of this practice, hitting targets and learning more clarity on radar, where did you go from there? From there, we went to Chesapeake Bay at Norfolk. We were there for a while. And then we went to Annapolis because uh, the name of the ship being Baltimore. They wanted the people to see the ship. But we weren't allowed to leave the ship at all. So it was almost like an open house for them to see this ship? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was that frustrating for some of you because you didn't want to be doing that? You wanted to be in the war? No, I think everybody was looking for liberties. They were, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how long did you stay in Annapolis before Just you shipped out again? A couple of days. Okay. And then did you go back overseas again? No, then we came back to Boston, and they did many alterations that they found while we were at Shakedown cruise, uh, cruise down in the, uh, Trinidad. So it was sort of like checking that punch list, so to speak, of a new piece yeah, of equipment. Right. Making sure everything and was working. And they changed everything around when we got back to South Boston. So once those repairs or changes were done, then what happened? Then we went through the Panama Canal. And what was that like? That was quite an experience because of the locks. You're down here and up in the sky, you see a big ship like a carrier. And you say, well, how are we going to get there? It was interesting. And then did you qu cross the equator at all at any point in time? Yes, that was uh, oh, sometime later right, we did. Mm -hmm. And did you have a rite of passage doing that? Isn't there some sort of a... Yeah, they have a, a ritual they go through. And did you, were you a part of that ritual? Oh, yes. Talk about that before we get into the nitty-gritty of... Well, when we passed uh, the equator... Of course, they made up uh, a Davy Jones locker, and and there was a sailor dressed up like Davy Jones, and they squirted water at you, made you walk through running water, and. Is there a King Neptune in yes, any of this? Yes, I, I had heard that. Was, yes, yeah, they do. Yeah. Was that, it? That lasted like a whole day. Did it? Yes. Yeah. So once then you're through the Panama Canal, when you're going through places like that, were you, any of you able to take pictures? We're, we weren't allowed any cameras. You weren't? Okay. No. So it was all a visual thing for yes. you by memory. Mm -hmm. And once you were through the canal, where did you go? Then we went to San Fran, no, we went to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And off the Catalina Islands, we did more bombing to see how we would do. I think it was like a week we were there. So did you all feel at some point that you were ready, willing, and able to now go forward? I suppose we were. And did you go from there, or were there other stops? No, then we went to San Francisco, mm -hmm. and it was quite an experience going underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. On the ship. Yeah. It was like... When you're out to sea like we were for like a year and you come back and you approach the Golden Gate, you're feeling you're entering heaven. Hmm. Was it a nice day, the day you went under? There was a slight fog, but sunny. Mm -hmm. So once, so you, here you are, 18 now maybe, yeah. 18 years old, yes. quite an experience that you've already had right. for a young boy. Yeah. So moving forward, I know that there were quite a f few experiences we want to cover, so tell me what happened then. Uh, on when? After you went through the Golden Gate and... Well, then we docked at a place called Mare Island, and we were there... Uh, we refueled and took aboard uh, all of our necessary 
food and ammunition. Then we went to Hawaii, and that was quite an experience reading about it. And when we entered Pearl Harbor, we were all on deck in our whites, and tears were coming down our eyes to see all the ships still underwater. So this was how how this was 1943. Three. Yeah. So you were witnessing firsthand the after effects of the bombing. Yes. 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 It was quite a sight. And how long were you stationed there? Oh, uh, we were there maybe a week or two. And then we entered into our first battle, which was the Gilbert Islands, which is not too far from, really, from Hawaii. Did you know this was going to be a battle, going to oh, the Gilbert? Oh, yes. Yeah. They prepared you ahead of time? Yes, yeah. Was there anxiety, excitement? What were you all feeling, do you think? You I especially? would say there was anxiety and being frightened, the unknown. And when we were approaching the Gilbert Islands before they did the landing, uh, a carrier was sunk, which was a short distance from us. So and we heard that. that explosion, and you say, "Wow, am I going, am I going to survive this?" Mm -hmm. And we did. And when you're talking about going into battle, what were you battling? Were you battling other ships, airplanes? More, more airplanes, mm -hmm. and we were there mainly to protect the carriers and do bombarding on the island for the uh, landing people that are going to... Uh, the troops that were yeah. landing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as the radar man, what were you looking at? Well, we were looking for like unknown aircraft or surface vessels and we would report it to one command ship. And from there, they directed the necessary forces that we needed. So you're going to Gilbert Island, and you said you're uh, protecting carriers and troops. How many ships, including the USS Baltimore, would there be in this group? In one task force, there could be up to 30 ships. So was it pretty noisy? No. So at this point, this is your first sort of direct combat. Yes, it was. <clears throat> at this point early on, were you concerned about or had you heard about kamikaze or anything like that? Not at that time. Mm -hmm. No. So how long did this battle last at the Gilbert Island? A couple of days. They secured the island very quickly. They meaning the uh, U.S.? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe it was the Marines at the time. Mm -hmm. And when you say they secured it, had it had Japanese on the island? Oh, yes. So in securing it, they either killed or got prisoners of war? Right. Did you see any of those prisoners? Or? No. Okay. No. Tell us more about some of your combat. Um, having this anxiety and this fear, did this last throughout your career? Or? Well, I would say like four to five battles, you've had that feeling. And then I think you become hard-shelled and it becomes like a normal routine job. You can kind of put the horror up aside yes. and, and think this is what I have to do in order right. to get us all back to safety again. Correct. And did that routine continue four hours on, eight hours oh, off? Oh, yes. So that Always. was very helpful. Yes. Tell us about some of your battles that... Um, 
are uh, almost too numerous to mention, <clears throat> but I know you do well, want to uh, mention some. Then our battles after that, we went to the Marshall Islands. And all, also before we went to the Marshall Islands, we did some uh, bombarding of the Guadalcanal landing. And after that, we proceeded to join the FAST task force of Admiral Halsey. And we attacked the, uh, the Marshall Islands, like Lake Kwajalein, and the We Talk and several of the other islands we bombarded several times, not only once. And during this time, was the ship ever hit? Close, but we never hit it. And what about other ships nearby? Uh, some of them uh, received uh, damage from an airplane, but they were survivable. And did you see that happen? Well, I was inside. I, I knew what was going on in the radar room, but you don't see anything. And in your off time, would you ever go up on deck, or were you allowed oh, yes. to? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Not during battle. You right. were, once you were assigned to a battle station, that's where you stayed. Mm -hmm. And my assignment was in the radar room, and I plotted aircraft attacks, and I was the only enlisted man on a gunnery line to the gunnery officers, and I felt that was quite important for me. And was it because you were good at what you did? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. And when you mention Admiral Halsey, you had heard about him before, oh, his yes. reputation. Mm -hmm. D did you get to meet or see him? or No. Oh. No. So Marshall Islands, how long were you there for that area? Well, that varied uh, for some time until we landed troops uh, on all those islands and conquered all the islands in that area. And this was strictly with the Japanese? Yes. There was one at Atoll in the Marshall Islands, I think it was called Majuro, and that's where that became one of our stopping stations for refueling and getting all the necessary equipment we needed. Such as, obviously, food. But what things surprised you that you had to get, if you remember anything like that? Food, fuel, ammunition. And we received our mail there. So that was exciting for oh, all of was, you, right? Yes, it was. So you were in de direct combat often. Mm -hmm. And it was against the Japanese. Yes. Did you start to form a camaraderie with your fellow radar men or others in that compartmentalized? We were very, a very close group and a very well-trained group. And we all got along, which was unusual, I think. Was there a difference in age, or were you all about Oh, the yes. Same? I was one of the youngest ones in there. You were. Did yeah. you find that they were kind of watching over you because yes. of that? Yes, they did. And what about the officers? Did they pay attention, or did they kind of leave you no, to No, your... they, were, they were very cooperative. Mm -hmm. They were very good. And d were they good leaders? Oh, excellent. Besides the Marshall Islands, where else did you go? And, and, and t talk a little bit about, because I know you have like two pages of missions that you went on mm -hmm. that you know, we certainly can't cover them all, but talk about some that you, you remember and historically they've come to the surface. Well, on another occasion. one would, 
and after that, we went to the Mariana Islands, and uh, that's where we battled the Japanese, and they called it a turkey shoot. Now, why and, did they call it a turkey shoot? Because of our excellent radar, we picked up all the aircraft, and we were able to direct our planes to attack them and, sh and shoot them down. And I think it was like 480 planes in one day they shot down, which kind of isolated them after that. That had to be some sort of a record. That was, yes. What was your rank at that time? At that time, I was a third class radar man. Do you have any other recollections that you want to share with us? Yeah, and we also uh, attacked uh, Wake Island and Truck Island. And one of our pilots, we had two seaplanes aboard our ship, which they launched to pick up a fighter pilot that was shot down in a lagoon. I think it was at Truck Island. And he was supported by two fighter planes. And they protected him, and he picked up the downed pilot and brought him back to our ship, which was a real Nice honor to have our, our plane pick up this down pilot. Felt like not yeah. only were you on the ship doing something, but yeah. over and above that, with yeah, the, the plane whole crew, on the yeah. whole crew. Yes. Why don't you insert here too about another pilot that was shot down that you met many years later? Oh yes, uh, uh, this was at the time of the landing in the Philippines, uh, we were chasing the Japanese fleet and we launched all our planes to chase the fleet and they had a long distance to go and on the return flight back, the pilots ran out of fuel and this one pilot was down and he was picked up by a submarine, which was very fortunate. I just wanted to interject. My daughter invited me to go to a Gunkwit, Maine. Recently? Yeah, uh, on Memorial Day. Okay, uh, 2009? Yes. Okay. And we ate at Barnacle Bill's Lobster Place. And we came out, there was a lot of commotion on the outside restaurant. And my daughter said, that's President Bush Sr. I said, well, I have to go and shake his hand. She said, well, what are you going to say to him? I said, well, you come with me. I went to President Bush. I shook his hand. And I said, it is a pleasure meeting you, Mr. President. I said, I was in the same battle when your plane was down and you were picked up by the submarine. And he hit me in the chest with his finger and he said, yes, that was September 2nd, 1945. And he shook my hand and it was such an honor for me to do that. I find it amazing with so many of these interviews that he, like you and others, hmm. remember the dates and the days like well, that, they were yesterday. That's an important day. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Talk about the weather. What was well, the weather like and what kind of experiences did you have with well, the weather? One of my fiercest battles I've ever been in was with Mother Nature. We were outside of the Philippines conducting a raid and we ran into a typhoon that lasted eight hours. And it was just the most horrible time I've ever had in the Navy. And then it, when we were 
invading Okinawa, we ran into another typhoon that lasted 16 hours. And we had three destroyers capsized and several of the aircraft carrier decks were bent like paper. And they, in order for them to launch, launch the planes, they had to go in reverse to launch, launch the planes. And one of our Baltimore-class cruisers, the USS Pittsburgh, lost its bow, which was 104 feet long. And there was another Natick resident who yeah. was on that ship. Yeah, um, a former uh, neighbor of mine, Joe Keating, I, he was a lieutenant aboard that ship. And the whole front, the point, yeah. the bow being the front point of the ship, right. came off. Yeah, right up to the eight-inch turret. That's amazing. It is. Yeah. It is. And when you say it was horrible with the typhoon, it's high winds, heavy, heavy rain. Yeah. You're out at sea. Right. And waves that... It, it, it's hard to describe how, how terrible it was because when your ship uh, went down in the bottom part of the wave and it went through and it would go, your ship would move like that. We had ropes all around the ship so you could hold on and not fall because everything was moist inside your ship. And eight hours is one thing. Sixteen hours means it really lingered over you, didn't it? Oh, it did. Did it cause damage to your ship? Yes, it did. It bent our bow slightly, and we were assigned to Hawaii to get it aligned. So not only were you facing an enemy with regards to the Japanese, but you were also facing an enemy known as typhoons. Yes. Yeah. Um, during your time on the ship, did you get any time off the ship? Only when we had, when we were in the United States, such as Hawaii or back at home. And were you able to relax then, or were you anxious to get back on ship and get out to sea? No, you're anxious to get off the ship and kind of enjoy yourself. And then when that, after a certain length of time, you're ready to go out to sea. Mm -hmm. Did you always think when you were younger that you would be on a ship or that you would like to be a No, sailor? I never thought of that. You never did? No. Are there any other battles you want to discuss? Well, uh, You mentioned earlier um, Okinawa. Yeah, we were at Okinawa. And uh, uh, we had, we were 1,300 uh, yards away from the USS Franklin aircraft carrier. And it was just after we had general quarters in the morning, uh, the kamikaze plane hit the Franklin, who was just fueling the planes, and ignited a huge black uh, smoke coming from the plane, and they lost 875 people aboard that ship. Basically, you were right beside it. Well, 1,300 miles is, uh, on a big ship is very close. 1,300 miles? Or uh, uh, yards, yards, I'm sorry. Yards, you had said, I thought, yeah. So. You go out and you see this. You get angry. Yeah. yeah. Angry like, like you never have seen. You want to go and... Yeah. So what happened? What happened after that? Well, they, they put the fire out and they, the ship returned to the United States. But I don't know what happened after that. But they lost 800 men. Yeah, 800. Did you ever feel like this could have been me? Yes, yes. Did yeah. you talk with each other about it when you were 
with oh, friends? We always did, yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a picture that we will be putting up on that website, uh, our veterans website that you brought in, and it, and it shows um, President Roosevelt with others. Do you want to talk about that? Certainly. Uh, we were assigned to come back to the United States, and they did repairs on our ship. To have, we didn't know that it was because of the president coming to our, aboard our ship but we were in San Diego, and we left at midnight to go to the Hawaiian Islands with the president and his chief of staff, Admiral Leahy, and several other dignitaries. And when we arrived in uh, Pearl Harbor, it was the most beautiful sight to see all the people all over the buildings looking at our ship because we had a string of flags. And uh, aboard our ship came Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur, and they discussed the advancement of victory against the Japanese aboard our ship. And, and were they with Roosevelt at that time? Yes, they were. And how soon before they arrived and Roosevelt arrived did you realize that's what was going to be happening? Or were you kept in the dark? We were kept in the dark. Were you able to get a good visual of them? or oh, Only when he was leaving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And when they were discussing this, were they behind closed doors? Oh, or was, yes, they uh -huh. were. But there were photo ops with photographers after yes. the fact. Uh, uh, only our ship photographer. And how long did they stay on the ship? Uh, they stayed aboard our ship uh, a day and then they met again somewhere in Hawaii, I don't know where. It must have been a military facility. And was security tight? Oh, very tight. Did you read about it after the fact? No, 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 I didn't. How long were you on the ship for, your career? My whole time, from 43 to 46. Are there any other events during that period of time that you want to talk about? There's just so much, I'm sure. That, there is. Yeah. I was surprised myself after I was reading it. Mm -hmm. Well, there was one interesting area uh, during the war. We entered the China Sea near Formosa, which is Taiwan today. Uh -huh. And we went into the China Sea, and we bombarded Hong Kong, Canton, and several other Chinese ports. And on, we heard on the radio Tokyo Rose say, there won't be a sailor leave the China Sea alive. And at midnight, we went by Formosa, and we all laughed. Uh, left and we just laughed about what she said but she spoke beautifully though was she actually an American no but she was educated at the University of Southern California though so you knew that whatever she was saying was actually propaganda, propaganda. Yeah. and also after the war uh, we were assigned to Curie Bay, which is a part of Hiroshima. And we went, we drove through that area, and it was shocking to see what one bomb could do. So you were off the ship, and you were able to mm -hmm. see firsthand. Yes. What do you remember about it most? What? Just that there was nothing there, and seeing people like walking in the days at that time. That was, I think we arrived there in November. 
which was a short time after the dropping. And of course, there was no evidence of radiation or anything at that time. And no buildings? No, no, they were all gone, nothing, for miles. But did you feel the dropping of the bomb was an important event to have had happen? I personally, yes, I do believe that. I know it's horror, but that's part of war. So once the war was over, you're still on your ship. Mm -hmm. And where did you go? Well, we, that's where we went to. You stayed in that area? First we uh, visited Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And then from Tokyo we uh, visited Nagasaki. And then we were assigned to Curie Bay, which is part of Hiroshima. And how do you spell Curie Bay? Do you know? K K U R E. Curie Bay. And were you assigned to that through the rest of your time on the yes, ship? Yes, and I, when I received enough points, I left the ship and came home to get discharged. And talk about points. Some people may not understand what exactly that means. Did you get additional points for certain experiences in the war, for how many uh, years I, you were in? How did that uh, work? All I know, I remember, but I'm not really definitely clear on it, but I, your age had something to do with it, and the length of time you were in the service, but how, how they calculated that. I, don't, I really don't remember it. So where and when were you discharged? I was discharged out of South Boston, Fargo Building. That's where it all began, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was January 23rd, 1946. So at this point now, you're probably, what, about 22 years old? Yes. You're still very young. Yeah. Do you feel your weapons, your ship, were equal to or better than or inferior to the Japanese? I personally believe it was superior. And I think our radar had a lot to do with our victory. So you can personally feel very good about that? Definitely. At what rank did you um, get discharged at that point? Uh, radar man, second class. And when I left, I was the senior petty officer of my division. And that was quite an honor, wasn't it? For me it, it was. I mean, being a kid, a really a dumb kid. <laughs> when you came home, what, what was it like? What were you feeling about coming home? At first, I would say I was lost. But then I adapted myself and went to work. Did you go back to get your high school education? How did yes. that work out? It worked. It was hard, but I did it. And then I attended five years of college as, as a pharmacist. Was it in Boston? Yes. Mass College of Pharmacy? Right. Why did you decide to go into that field? Well, I worked at a pharmacy before I entered the service, and my uncle owned two drugstores in Boston and asked me to help him out. Convenient, <laughs> yes, yeah. When you came home, did you discuss with your family or friends what you had seen or what you had been through in the service? The only one I discussed it with was with my father, and I didn't go into much detail. And when you said earlier that you kind of felt lost, was it because suddenly, and I don't want to use the term loosely, but the adventure, so to speak, was over? I, I think so. Mm -hmm. And you said that you were a close-knit group. Did you stay close with individuals? Yes, I did. 
Did you join any unit of the military reserve? No, I didn't. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, I joined them all. Are you still active in any of them? The only one I'm active is in the uh, DAV. Disabled veterans? Mm-hmm. And you were disabled? Uh, just minor, nothing too serious. And was it directly related to the war? Yes. Do you want to talk about that? No. Okay. Have you received veterans benefits? Did you use the GI Bill? Yes. And, and that helped you through your Mass College of Pharmacy? Correct. And what about hospitalizations or insurance? Well, I did go to the VA for a short period, and then I just go use my own personal health insurance. Do you attend any reunions of your old outfit? Yes, we, whenever we had them, I did in this area. Mm -hmm. And how important to you was serving in the military? I think it made a great person out of me and understanding other people. And I thought we have ended all the wars, but we haven't. Does that bother you? Yes, it does. Why? Because uh, I think the insecurity that's happening, the uneasiness, that bothers me. Do you feel in any way being in the service affected your life? I know you said earlier that it gave you an understanding of other people, but yeah. in what other ways it well, affected your life? I think it just made me observe laws better and made me a better citizen. When you mentioned earlier about understanding other people, do you feel that that was because there was such a diverse group oh, without a in doubt. the ship or on yeah. the ship? Yes, I do believe that. Looking back, is there any memorable either experience, person, or humorous activity, or all of the above that you want to chat with us about? Uh, I don't really can't pinpoint anything particular. But you did say that you have maintained friendships with some of these individuals. Is that even present day that you still? Yeah, well, I only have one left. And was he a radar man also? Yes. And you still stay in touch with him? Yes, he lives in Tewksbury. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there one thought or anything um, else that you would like to share or a comment that you would like to share with us and with your family who will be reviewing this tape with us? I really don't, to tell you the truth. I just consider myself being very fortunate that I was able to return alive. And when you say that, you had said in the very beginning of this interview that so many of your friends were in and you were feeling a bit lost, so that's along with doing your duty, you felt you wanted to go in. Did all of your friends come back? Oh, yes. Good. Yes, Good. they did. Well, Edward S. Raddick, we want to thank you for uh, being with us. And I know um, we have a wonderful picture that we're going to show after this interview that you've had framed. And it shows you as a young man and some of your medals and awards. But we'd like to thank you for com coming in today and sharing your story with us. It was my pleasure being with you. Thank you. Thank you.